Well, good morning, Crossing Church. It's good to see everyone here. Kids, you can go. You can have fun. Enjoy yourselves. My name is Joey Pursuti. I'm an elder candidate here at the Crossing Church, and this is your first time here. Thanks so much for coming and hanging out with us this Sunday. I hope you had a good week. My family just came back from a week-long vacation, which was amazing. I got a good tan, and I got to read some cool books, uh, and got to hang out with the family. So it was cool to learn Yahtzee for the first time, and apparently I'm really bad at it because I never won. Uh, But it was an awesome time to kind of regroup, refocus, refresh, and get our minds right as we begin. As I got back here yesterday, so I'm preparing for today's sermon. We just finished a mini-series within Mark where Jonathan did a mini-series of the Upside-Down Kingdom. And we saw that the Upside-Down Kingdom has an upside-down family, a message, and a, and a faith. And it's very different than what we're used to. It's very different than what you may be grown up in or what you see in the world. Uh, the reality is the Upside-Down Kingdom is just very, very different. And that's why it's called an Upside-Down Kingdom. And as I go forward today, I'm doing Mark 6. And as I go through Mark 6, I'm going to be dealing with something that it seems like for the second sermon in a row, I get to deal with somewhat of a negative topic. But if I were to preach a sermon, this is not the sermon I would want to preach. And this is the cool thing about preaching through a series that requires you to stick to the text, right? And it makes you have to preach the things you don't want to preach. I get to preach on rejection. And that's being rejected by the world, that concept of being in the kingdom, but yet being rejected while in the kingdom. And so today we're going to be going through Mark 6. And so if you don't have a Bible, that's perfectly fine. We have slides that have the text on there. Today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be going through what's called the Christian Standard Bible. It's a translation of the original languages. It's just as good as the English Standard Version. Uh, The reason why I picked that, I want to briefly just tell you, is that it's a translation that came out a couple years ago. Uh, It's the same translation as the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It's a little bit different. And it's a phenomenal translation. It uses what's called word for word and thought for thought. It kind of blends both in what's called optimal equivalence. So cool, you're probably not interested. But if you are interested, this is the Bible I'll be using. It's the same, it's just like any other Bible. I don't make it sound like it's a cult. But this is, it's what's called a reader's Bible. It's so cool. Reader's Bible is there's no verse numbers at all. And if you remember, Jonathan talked about a couple weeks ago, in 1551, they created verses in the text and created chapters and the New Testament is 5051, 1571 in the Old Testament. So this is kind of neat because you're reading it as if you're reading a book. And it's obviously God's word. It's not a book. It's way beyond that. But it's reading it without any verses, without any interruption. So it's really cool. And if you're interested in looking at it, seeing what it's like, we actually have a reference table out in the front that shows some pics from the elders of what we're reading and including this Bible. So you can kind of look on it, look at it, and see if you think that would be something you're interested in doing. So let's go to Mark chapter 6. Before we get into the text, I want to pray real quick. Our Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now, God, with our minds hopefully open. We ask that you open our hearts and open our ears to the message of your word. God, that I ask that if anyone here that has not received salvation, that has not been called by you, that God, today would be the day of salvation. We ask that you allow the word of God to mold our lives, allow us to shape our way of thinking as as we live in this world. God, allow us to appreciate the kingdom that you've called us to, but also accept the reality that is required of being in the kingdom. We thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so Mark 6, 1 through 6. I'll put it on the screen. All right, he left there. And this is Jesus, obviously. He left there and came to his hometown. All right? So Jesus has just been around the Sea of Galilee. He's going back and forth, doing his thing, making miracles, doing all this awesome stuff. And he comes back, and he goes to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. So automatically, his hometown, where is that at? Nazareth, right? Nazareth is, like, not a cool place to go to. If you want to go on vacation with a family, the last place you would ever go to is a town called Nazareth. Nazareth is a poor city. It's not got a lot of income. It's on the outskirts of the bigger metropolises, right? Uh, It's not really that big at all. Uh, So therefore, it's a very poor city. It's where poor people generally live. Lower income, lower kind of viewed people would live in this city or this town. It's also an insignificant city. Nazareth is not well known by any stretch of historical reality. It's never mentioned in the Old Testament. 
which there's a lot of towns in the New Testament talked about in the Old Testament. Nazareth is never mentioned. It's the forgotten city, the forgotten town. And not only is it insignificant and it's poor, it's also very small. Like, there's, we think there's probably about 500 people living in Nazareth around Jesus' this time. There's really no way to figure that out because why? It's not an important city. <laughs> no one did a lot of historical research on the city because it just was not really cool to be there. So the fact is, Jesus has lived in Nazareth. Remember, he was born in Bethlehem. He had to get kicked out and moved and went to Egypt, and then he had to come back, and then he lived the rest of his life in Nazareth, which is in kind of the county of Galilee, and that's important later on. So, he comes to his hometown, Nazareth. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. When the Sabbath came, that would be a normal Saturday event for Jesus as a Jew in Nazareth, going to his weekly Saturday service at church. Like, these are people who have seen him his whole life. I mean, he was circumcised there as a a little baby. I mean, this is his home church. They have known him all of his life, and Jesus has been around these people, been around their kids, been around those vacation Bible schools, been around all those different events growing up in synagogue. And so now he's there, and he's going to teach at the synagogue. The the child who once sat in the pew is now up on the pulpit, and he's teaching in the synagogue, and here's here's what happens. The response is, many who heard him were astonished. They were astonished at what he was saying. That Greek is ekpleso. It's thunderstruck. Not ACDC, but you can kind of follow it. But they're thunderstruck. Like they are like in all of this guy who's teaching. This is the kid we saw growing up teaching. So they are struck, amazed by what he's saying. So why, why are they amazed? Well, here's what it says in Mark. Where did this man get these things? They said, what is this wisdom that has been given to him, and how are these miracles performed by his hands? Notice the first one, where? Where did this man get these things? We've seen him all our life. This little kid, Jesus, son of Joseph and Mary, where did he come up with this stuff that he's saying that's got us thunderstruck? Well, we know from Scripture, we know where they came from. It came from God, right? In fact, it says in John 7, 7, 16, it says, Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. That's the Father. So we know where it came from, but they were thunderstruck. They could not understand where the teaching came from. Number two, what is this wisdom that has been given to him? His teaching is so profound, it's considered wisdom by the skeptics. The skeptics can't deny what he's saying is truth, it's valid, it's wisdom, but we'll find out pretty quickly they still reject it. They still say, no, it's not good enough. And so the wisdom there is something that's profound, and we find out later in Proverbs and also in 1 Corinthians that Jesus Christ is actually the wisdom of God. A little bit of uh, irony in that. But number three, how? And this is really important to see. How are these miracles performed by his hand? Now, you have to emphasize his hands because he's Jesus. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. Notice what it says here, and this kind of really qualifies his hands. Here's the follow-up questions in the text. Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. The fact of the matter is, when they ask the question, isn't this the carpenter, we often think carpenter is someone who does wood, right? Like who just builds with wood. It can also be masonry. It could be stone use, like building stones and building stuff with that and also wood. But notice that isn't this the carpenter? He is a very low economic status. This is not a king of kings in the sense of the secular world. He is a carpenter. He's like the janitor of the world. He's just a common man who comes from a common people And then notice what it says here, the son of Mary. It's also qualifying, it's almost a pejorative term. The son of Mary should have been the son of Joseph in that time. But the reason why it's son of Mary, once some scholars say it's actually because Joseph is dead. I don't think that's really it, historically. I think the reason is the son of Mary is an insult on the virgin birth itself. It's an insult because they assume that because Mary and Joseph had married, but she gave birth to a baby named 
Jesus, that she was responsible and she was slandered and looked at badly because she was, uh, you know, gave herself up, right? She gave birth to a son and she claims that it's from God. The simple reality is the son of Mary was a pejorative term, nothing good, nothing, not, nothing pleasant about it. And then also the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and are his sisters here with us? The fact is, they're looking at his siblings. We had, this is proof, actually, that Mary had more than just one child. I mean, she had children. I mean, that goes to another doctrinal issue. But the beauty of it is, they're now associating Jesus with his people around him. I don't know about you, but if I'm ever uh, looked at by my siblings, if someone looks at my sister and associates my sister's bad acts, and she's not a bad person, so I'm not saying that, but if they were to look at her bad acts, they would probably impugn that onto me. They would impute it onto me, right? They would look at me. So there's a sense here that they look at his siblings as if this guy is no different than them. So why is he special and they're not? We've seen them. They've all grown up. They've played in the same streets, the same gravel roads, the same dirt paths as our kids. There is nothing unique about this man, but yet he's teaching with authority. Here's what Jesus says as we go further. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. This is a famous quote that Jesus is either, we think, creating or he's quoting somewhere. But the fact of the matter is, notice how it brackets off. A prophet, so Jesus calls himself a prophet by that. A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives. So we got the town of Nazareth. Now we got his cousins, his, his outside family. And then we got the inner circle here, the home. So it goes from big, small, big medium, and small. But notice in all this what Jesus is trying to illustrate. When he says a prophet's not without honor, what we know from the scriptures in John 1, 1, excuse me, John 1, 11, it says, and he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. We know that even Jesus' household, his relatives, and his own home would ultimately reject him. And Jesus is actually kind of hearkening back to a time where two other prophets went through this in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha. And both prophets, according to the scriptures, uh, they were rejected by their own people. In fact, there's stories of them going to the Gentiles who were not God's people and going to do these miracles to them because they would get it, they would receive it with humility, and God's people wouldn't. This follows the same exact pattern as Jesus has demonstrated. And so what we see in all of this, and to finish up the text, verse 5 and 6, and he was not able to do a miracle there except that he laid his hands on a few people, sick people, and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. He was going around the villages teaching. Ultimately, they and Jesus, not that he was limited because he could not do it. He chose not to do it because of their unbelief. The people who saw Jesus growing up did not want to believe that something good could come out of them. Could come out of their town. Could come out of their city. Their kind of lower income status, something this great cannot come. And what we see is Jesus is rejected. Jesus is rejected by his own community, by his own people, by his own church. And we see that rejection leads, though, to a new community. In this moment, Jesus is demonstrating what Mark is trying to show is that gospel living in the kingdom is also going to require sometimes a little bit of rejection. It requires some rejection from your community to get out of your comfort zone. And Jesus shows that really and truly, his family that rejected him, his cousins, his relatives, his home church, the reality is, that's not his family. We saw this a couple weeks ago with Jonathan preaching in Mark 3, 35. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Simple fact of it is, Mark 3, 35 demonstrates to us that the true family of God, the true community, is one that is called by God and lives out the kingdom. But also, I don't know about you, but in my own family, when, I, when God called me to salvation at 14, it was an interesting experience because I was, it wasn't received very well. In fact, it was often looked down upon in my family just because I was very skeptical about it. And so that rejection that occurred in my own family and sometimes in my own community, because you got to get this. In your hometown, people know you, right? Like they know all the things you've done, all the stupid stuff you've done, all the mistakes you've made. Like they are going to be your best and worst critics at the same time. They've seen the old man, the old woman. They've seen the old self. 
they can't reconcile the new self unless they've been called by God. They can't. So the fact of the matter is, what we see in this is that we can't, as Christians in the kingdom, go back to our old community sometimes because they're going to reject us. But what we're called to do is to go to a new community to live out the gospel kingdom. So I don't know about you, like I need church. Like I want it, but I I need it because the reality is when I go to work and I go through uh, five days of work and then I get home, uh, my mind is so boggled down by the the secular world that I live in and by the, the kind of different ideas and different goals and values and mission statements that I deal with in the world that when I come to church, it's a restart, a refresh to my whole week. So I need church. I don't know about you. Maybe you can do it once Sunday. Maybe you cannot. <laughs> but I need it every day if I can find it. Because what I understand is I'm going to be rejected while living in the world. And therefore, I need a community that can hold me together, hold me accountable, and make me better. Only in a church can people, should, not churches, all churches don't do this, but should, a church, a church should allow you to come to people, confess your sins, rebuild refresh, restart. That's what a new community, they're not there to point out your flaws or there to try to help you get over those flaws. And as we become honest with each other, that's the new community that Christ is wanting to create in this kingdom of God. So, now let's go to the next section here. So we got a rejection leads to a new community. Mark 6, 7 through 13. So Jesus, and this is kind of the weird thing about this this passage, is it just breaks off very differently. So we see verse 7. He, Jesus, summoned the 12 and began to send them out in pairs. So he, Jesus, summons. Summons is a very courtly, kingly term. Uh, When you file a lawsuit, I know a little bit about this. When you file a lawsuit, you send someone a summons. You give them a heads up, something's coming. And in fact, it's sometimes a court order summons. It's like, you better do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be responsible. You're going to get in trouble. Jesus, as king, summons his 12. Now, we know later on they're called the apostles the rest of the way. But this is the first time we really see he summons the 12. And what does he tell them to do? And he begins to send them out in pairs. The pairs are there really to show, one, uh, to hold people accountable. So if people are making stuff up about the apostles, they got, they got two people there. They got two witnesses, right? They can, like, talk about how the fact they can see what was said. But also, it was there for mutual support. To go out and be summoned out to go out, you need to go out in pairs so that you can mutually build up each other, encourage each other. And he gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them, this is important, to take nothing for the road except a staff, no bread, no traveling bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals, flip-flops, and not be put on an extra shirt. So no bread, no traveling bag, no money. So how are they going to eat? That's Mark saying, don't worry about that. No traveling bag. How are they going to bring their stuff, their junk? Don't worry about that. No money. How are you going to pay for things? How are you going to, you can't pay, pal. You can't use your credit card. You got, I mean, well, you guys could pay, pal, technically. You couldn't use your credit card. Don't put on an extra shirt. What that's telling us is that when it gets cold at night, you can't put on an extra layer of clothes to keep yourself warm, which tells us what? That they were depending on going to someone's house. Someone was going to open their home. And we actually see, he said to them, whenever you enter a house, Stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So we see that the the rejection here is, is no stuff, no food, no stuff, no money, no problems, right? It's like Kenny Chesney's song. And the reason why that song is like often liked upon, and I can't stand it because it's overplayed now, but the reason why it's liked upon is because it's the idea of just like getting away. It's full dependence not on this worldly stuff, right? Like that's why it's so popular. And what he's trying to tell them, he's trying the only thing you can take when you're summoned by God for the kingdom is you need to take flip-flops and you need to take a staff. Now, the staff was for the treacherous roads that we have to walk down because it's all mountainous areas. So that was going to allow them to walk and also the, the flip-flops, the sandals. But everything else, you depend on God. Get nothing else in your way. Just depend completely on God while you're living in the kingdom. 
But here's the other big thing. Notice this, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and they preached and that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So they would be summoned to go out with nothing, right, but a few of the very bare minimum. They would go out and they'd go to these towns and they'd preach the gospel. And when they would preach the gospel, those who would reject the message of God, what, they, what would they do? I, I make it equivalent to brushing off the dirt off their shoulder. That's exactly what it is, right? Now, that has probably changed some different uh, meanings over the years, but the point of it is when they dust the feet, the du- they, they take the dust off their feet from the place they were at, it's a form of judgment to the person who just rejected the message. They wanted nothing to do with the fact that that person just rejected the gospel message. So they would go, and they would try to stay where they could stay, and God would provide, and they would go to somewhere else. And then they go somewhere else. And if they someone rejected, they would remove the dust and they would continue on. So what do we see out of this? We see there's no Trivago or Airbnb here. This is complete and utter dependence on God. And that tells us rejection of the message for sure. But rejection leads to a dependence on God. There's two points within this. Rejection from others. There are going to be those who won't accept the message that we preach. There's going to be those who won't accept the gospel. Our job isn't to try to persuade them or woo them over. Our job is to present. That's it. Our job is to love and care for them, no doubt. But our job isn't to try to strangle them and get them on the same page as us. That's God's job. You plant the seed, God grows it. And so what we see is that those, there's going to be those who reject the gospel, but let's get this. When someone rejects the gospel, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting the message drafted by the Almighty God who loves them. The punishment is not for you to decide, it's for God to decide. So that's why when we go out and preach the gospel to people, we don't have to worry about their reaction or response. If we do it with love and grace, then we've done our job. But rejection also can include ourselves. Actually, it should include ourselves. Just like this passage demonstrates, we are called, not only we're going to get rejected from others, but we're going to reject ourselves and the pursuit of serving others. See, the reality is we are unable to freely preach the gospel if we are enslaved to ourselves. We cannot freely do anything if we are too obsessed and fixated on ourselves, right? So the point of this message, or what, try to, what Jesus is trying to say, is get rid of all that stuff you think you need and focus on a God who will providentially provide for you and all things. Sometimes in our churches, we get confused. We think that God providing for us means he's going to provide us abundant things, right? Like we get all this stuff. We get the job we've always wanted. We get the cars. We get the glamour. We get all that stuff. The fact of the matter is that is not what God wants for you. What he wants is for you to be content with what he's already given you and what he continues to give you. Give you. That's what God's providence is. And so the bare minimum for the disciples and the apostles is the same for us. We have to reject ourselves if we want to try to even remotely try to preach the gospel. And trust me, that is not easy to do at all. It's very challenging to do that. And it's an ongoing process. It never ends. But if we have distractions, we can't focus. If we have distractions, we can't freely do whatever it takes to preach the gospel. Uh, I'm reminded of a couple uh, who uh, is, works with 6-8 Ministries, uh, the MacArthur family. The coolest people, I think this because they're my generation, that's why. And this is Josh and Allie with their three kids, beautiful kids, and they are with 6-8 Ministries down in Costa Rica. As you know, our elder, Spencer Bolter, is president of that. He leads that, and I had a chance to meet with him. And this is me being me. I asked Josh, that guy there, and I said to him, how do you do it, man? How do you do it without having Chick-fil-A? How do you do it? He's like, oh, it's not that hard. I'm like, no, 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 like, how do you seriously do it? And so these are stupid questions asked for me because that's me not knowing how to reject. And this is a couple who met at a Bible college out in California. And they came and they just, they were completely submissive to God's will. They sacrificed themselves, they sacrificed their life, they rejected themselves of all the things that we think we need, and now they are serving beautiful orphans and kids uh, who need loving families in Costa Rica. 
There's a ladies' trip coming up soon. I, I encourage the ladies, if you haven't gone there to Costa Rica to go serve, but man, it's awesome to see that. That is an example that I could not remotely even get close to. But man, that is so awesome to see that just like Jesus summoned those apostles, he has summoned this family and he summons us today to do very similar things to our own community. Missionaries aren't just missionaries to the world outside of the U.S. It can be down the street. It can be in your own neighborhood. It can be just down the road, right? It can be in your community, your county. We can be missionaries in our own ways and be summoned by the same God and reject ourselves just like that family did. So that is rejection leads to a dependence on God. Now, you would think Mark would be very consistent in writing this. Now I get to talk about history, which I wish I could have done the whole time because I love history. But, but now I get to talk a little bit about history. So Mark 6.14 because now we go through dealing with the apostles being summoned, dealing with Jesus being rejected at Nazareth. Now we go to Herod Antipas and the beheading of John the Baptist. But there's something very beautiful going on behind the scenes that we don't see. So real briefly, let me read 614. King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. What did he hear? Well, he just heard what the summoned apostles were preaching throughout all of Galilee. Now, the, the, the fact of the matter is you need to know who Herod is, and I, and I don't have the time to get as much into this as I like. But let me give you real quickly what this guy Herod is. There's a lot of Herods in the scriptures. That's because a lot of the Herods are really jacked up. Like, they got a lot of wife's problems, like wives problems. They got a lot of sin problems. Like, they're pretty bad off. And so, Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great. Now, you may have heard of Herod the Great in your Christmas time stories. Herod the Great is the great because he's well known for really ruling with paranoia, immorality, and just very good, strong power. Like, he was a really heroic king, but he was extremely immoral. He was a puppet king of the Roman Empire, and here's what he ruled. He ruled all of Israel, for the most part. And he's responsible for what's called the massacre of the infants. Remember that story in Matthew 2 where Jesus and his family has to flee to Egypt? Why did they have to flee? Because there's, there's rumors going around. Herod the Great's hearing that there's this baby being born, and he's called the king. He freaks out. He's paranoid. His authority from a little baby is being usurped, and he's freaking out. So what does he do? He gets all the key kids, two years and under, in the town of Bethlehem, and he massacres all of them. He kills them. He kills them. Jesus and his family leaves and goes to Egypt. That's how sick this guy is. He's crazy. In fact, the emperor, uh, Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of the Roman Empire, once said famously, it is better to be Herod's pig than to be his son. Now imagine that life. Imagine being born to Herod the Great. And one of the reasons why that is because, one, Herod killed a lot of his kids. He killed his brothers. He killed his family because he was constantly obsessed with power. But we also know he's popular because he was responsible for what's called Herod's temple. And we should have a model on the screen for you. And that's obviously not the real thing because it's pretty much gone. Uh, but that is what's called Herod's temple. And it's the same temple that the Jews rebuilt in Ezra and Nehemiah's day. But what Herod did was to put his name on it. He essentially uh, renovated and expanded it even more to make himself look better. So it's called often Herod's temple. That would be the same temple that Jesus would go in and, you know, top what's called the cleansing of the temple. He would move those tables over and uh, he would demonstrate his authority there. And ultimately, when Herod the Great dies, what happens to when daddies die? Last time I preached on this in Nehemiah 1. Well, now there's an issue of the kingdom being split up. The kingdom is split up to four parts. One part is ruled by Herod Antipas. And we should have a map on the screen of the Herodian dynasty. That's the, you'll see it. I found some pretty colors for you guys. And so purple is important because that's what Herod Antipas now rules. That's the Herod that's talked about in the scriptures right here. Notice what he controls. He controls Galilee and Perea. Perea is not really relevant here. It can be, but Galilee is the important part. And what's in Galilee? Nazareth. The bulk of Jesus' ministry is in Galilee. It's in Nazareth, right? It's in that whole area. So Herod has legal authority over Jesus in Galilee. But notice a little bit, here's a little side note for you guys. The red part, that big chunk, is Herod Archelaus. Archelaus was a really dumb king. He did such a bad job, because remember, they're puppets of the Roman Empire. So they're kind of on their own, independent. 
He does such a bad job that eventually Rome says, get him out. He's horrible. We're going to put a new guy in. We're going to put, put our own governors in. And one of those governors would be Pontius Pilate. And that's where Jesus would ultimately die, right? Just an interesting side note. So anyways, we got Herod the Great, or excuse me, Herod uh, the Great's kingdom now dissolves. Now we have Herod Antipas controlling the area up there. And so we know Herod the Great, or excuse me, Herod Antipas follows his dad. He's just as paranoid. He's just as crazy. And guess what? He's got that silver spoon effect. You know what I mean? When your daddy's got a lot of money or mommy's got a lot of money and you live off of that, guess what happens? You become spoiled. You're entitled to everything. You know what I'm talking about. And so Herod Antipas has got the same problem. He's living the life and he's done nothing to earn it. Just by birth. He gets all this. He gets this little king in the sliver. And so the reality is when they call him a king, as Mark did, it's really sarcastic because he's not a king. He doesn't have a big kingdom. It's really sarcastic. He's really just a ruler of a little sliver of land. And in fact, he is so disrespected and looked down upon as a joke, Jesus would call him something else. He would call him a fox. Now, it wouldn't be fox as in like he's sly and cunning. He was a fox because a fox is an inferior animal, right? It's a small animal. And Jesus, and actually in Luke 13, 32, the Pharisees go to Jesus at one point and say, hey, this Herod Antipas, he's coming to kill you. Like, aren't you scared? And Jesus says, you tell that fox, such a weird way to call people names, but you tell that fox, I'll be done when I'm done, and when I'm done, he can do whatever he wants. I got stuff to do for my father, who's way greater than him. You tell that fox to just, you know, bug off. I'm, I'm good right now. What Jesus is saying is, Herod, you're not as strong as you think you are. You're just some little spoiled brat who got his daddy's kingdom, and you don't know how this works. So he's vile, he's immoral, he has a lot of wives. And in fact, just like his dad, what does he do? He marries his half-brother Philip, and I can't get into this because it's so crazy. His half-brother Philip, his wife, all right? They have an affair, Herodias. They have an affair, so Herod Antipas has an affair with uh, uh, Herodias, who has a kid named Salome, that'll be important in a second, who's technically his niece, Antipas' niece. All right? You'll see why that's important in a second. This is an immoral family. <laughs> All right, so let's go through the next of the text. I'm, that was my side of history. Let's get back to the text. So King Herod heard about it because Jesus' name had become well known. He is threatened like Herod the Great, that his name, the name of Christ, the name of a king is being used. Some said John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah. Still others said he's a prophet like one of the prophets from long ago. And when Herod heard of it, he said, John, the one I beheaded, has been raised. Herod had killed John the Baptist. And now Mark gives us an explanation of how that event occurs. But Herod is hearing stories about this prophet named Jesus running around. And he thinks that Jesus is actually John the Baptist. He thinks that John the Baptist was resurrected and became Jesus. So what do you think here is Antipas is doing? He's paranoid. He's freaking out. He's saying, oh my gosh, that guy's coming to haunt me. He's coming to get me. He's coming to show me that I was an idiot for doing this. And here's the story that Mark tells us about the beheading of John. I told you it was not something I would pick generally, but this is what we got. All right? For Herod himself had given orders to arrest John and to chain him in prison on account of Herodias. His brother Philip's wife, because he had married her, Here's what John, why, why would that be important? Because here's what John was saying. John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. John is not ashamed of the truth. And he sticks up to Herod. He sticks up to Herod and says, dude, you are committing sin. It's a violation of Leviticus 18. You cannot be marrying your brother's wife. And so what happens? And this gives us more of a story. So Herodias held a grudge. She didn't like being called out against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. Why not? Because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing he was a righteous and holy man. Herod Antipas knew John did nothing to deserve death. He did nothing wrong. He was speaking the truth. Yeah, he, he's a vile person. Yeah, I get it. Okay, what's the big deal? But Herodias can't take it. So when Herod heard him, he would be very perplexed 
And yet he liked to listen to him. He's so sick, right? He's perplexed. The Greek is opereo. It's, it's the idea that it's more than perplexed. It's like, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I don't understand why I like it, but I like it. I don't get it. I'm opereo. Like, I'm perplexed. Like, why is it that this guy is telling me I'm a horrible individual, and yet I just don't want to kill him? And that's because of his sin, right? His sin, his consciousness is kicking in, trying to remind him of God's holy law. And Herod is so sinful and so in debt to sin that he can't get out of it on his own. So here's important. An opportune time came on his birthday. That's Herod and Epaphras' birthday. When Herod gave a banquet for his nobles, military commanders, and the leading men of Galilee. Remember, he runs Galilee, okay? Now notice this, it's a banquet. Imagine a fraternity party gone wild. Go to an FSU or UF fraternity party, and that's what you're going to see in this. This is probably way, way, way worse, if that's possible. This is vile, among, like beyond imagination. You got a bunch of bros there, intoxicated to the brim, right? Like they're just drinking nonstop. They got women there. It's all about boasting themselves. It's just nothing but a bro fest. That's all this is. And then it says right here, when Herodias' own daughter came in and danced. Now remember who she was. That's Salome. That's Herod Antipas' niece, who's, we think, 12 to 14 years old. Okay? When Herodias' own daughter, so Herod Antipas' her uncle, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. We assume that's sexual dancing. His niece, 12 to 14 years old, is sexually dancing for her uncle. The king said to the girl, ask me whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. In his drunken mind, in his unstable mind, he's saying, Salome, whatever you want, I will give it to you. Just tell me what you want. He promised her with an oath. Now he swore with a legal authority. He says, whatever you ask me, I will give it up. I will give you up to half my kingdom, a kingdom that didn't exist, a kingdom that he had an authority to get rid of. But he's drunk. He's bragging. He wants to impress his niece. So what does she do? Well, she follows her mom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? John the Baptist's head, she said. No, no other options, you know. Have a nice vineyard maybe, looking over the ocean. Nice little Airbnb, you can rent out, make some money. No, none of that. She wants John the Baptist's head because remember, he's the one that's been speaking bad things against her and her love affair with Herod Antipas. At once she hurried to the king and said, I want you to give me John the Baptist's head on a platter immediately, as if she is a cannibal, as if she's eating. I mean, we can joke about it, but this is vile, right? Like, this is just evil. Although the king was deeply distressed because of his oaths, and the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Like, he's like, oh, man, she really took that seriously, didn't she? She really got that serious. Oh, man. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I can't look bad in front of my bros at my fraternity party, right? I can't look bad. And I, I just made a legal authority. Like, I just decreed this. I, bet, I better do this. Um, even though I know he's a holy and righteous and just man. So the king immediately sent for an executioner and commanded him to bring John's head. So he went and beheaded him in prison. So John's in prison. We think he's in prison for about a year now. And he brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. That's his niece. Then the girl gave it to her mother. And when John's disciples heard about it, they came and removed his corpse and placed it in a tomb. Herod was murdered and beheaded at what's called Machiris. It's this beautiful view if you weren't in the dungeon. We have a photo of it, I think, on the screen. That's where it remains today. It's gone, obviously. But it's a beautiful view if you could see it, right? That's where we think he was, according to Josephus, the great Jewish historian, that's where we think he was beheaded. And John the Baptist, the person that Jesus would declare as the greatest person who ever lived. That's exactly what the text says. No one born of woman has ever been as greater than John the Baptist, is what Jesus proclaimed. Put that on your resume. It's pretty cool. John the Baptist is now dead. And he's the last prophet of the entire Old Testament. It's the last one. And he is the greatest because he is introducing the prophet of all prophets, Jesus. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us that 
even in our final state, John the Baptist being the prophet he is, preaching the message of God, the gospel, the, the, the saving message of Christ, that people were still so wicked they, they rejected it. But ultimately, rejection leads to the cross. John's rejection from the world, from Herod Antipas, shows us that our life is at stake when we live in the kingdom. That's why this isn't fun to preach. <laughs> I want to give you all the good stuff, but let me tell you, this is the reality of the kingdom. 11 out of the 12 apostles, the ones that Jesus summoned, were martyred in the first 100 years of the church. I would almost argue 12 of them, but 11 of the original 12, because one was Judas and he betrayed and committed suicide. 11 of the 12 were martyred for preaching the gospel in all kinds of crazy, sick ways. But see, what John represents to us, what Mark is showing us is that John the Baptist is really going to, he is the example of what's about to happen to the apostles. This is the recorded, first recorded event of someone living in the kingdom, preaching the kingdom, and being rejected in the kingdom, and dying for it. But also important, Mark shows us in this story that this is a preview of Jesus' own cross about to occur. Notice the similarities, all right? Before I get to that, I want to tell you one more thing. Remember, Herod is excited to meet Jesus. He wants to see this Jesus. In fact, we know in scriptures that he ultimately meets Jesus Herod Antipas meets him, and he's so excited to see him, according to the scriptures, all right? And guess what happens? Here's where he meets him. We have a painting by Buccio, who is a medieval Italian painter. You know I'm weird, so I have to put stuff like that on, this, on the screen. This is where Jesus would meet Herod. And obviously, this is not, by any means, a realistic depiction. This is done from their perspective. Jesus would meet Herod Antipas right before he would go to the cross, when he would go to Pilate, remember, he was in Bethlehem, and Pilate would say, I don't want anything to do with this man. He's done nothing wrong. You know what, Herod, you're in town. Go see him because he was under your authority when he was doing all that stuff. So he goes to see Herod and pass, and the scriptures say he was happy to see him. One, we think he's happy because he's not John the Baptist. Herod's seen John the Baptist. This ain't no John the Baptist. So the paranoia has stopped. But he then says, Jesus, do something for me. Show me a miracle. And what does Jesus say? He says nothing. He's silent. And what they do next is what the robe signifies, is they put an elegant or gorgeous robe, we think it's a purple robe, to mock his kingship. And they put a robe, and they said, go back to Pilate. And you know the rest of the story. He goes back to Pilate, and the, and the people declare, crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate's is, or excuse me, Herod is this huge part in redemption history, but what we see is the similarities between Herod and Pilate is hugely, like, it's just amazing, the similarities. Pilate was hesitant to kill Jesus. Herod was hesitant to kill John. Herod was interested in the message of John, right? He liked it. So was Pilate when he said, what is truth to Jesus? Herod is requested by others for the death of John. Herod doesn't want to kill John. Pilate is requested by the Jews and ultimately the Roman authority to kill this bandit named Jesus. The message of John and Jesus are the reasons for their own death. Herod and Pilate, they, sh they, they put their deaths on a display. One's on a platter and one's on a cross. The disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus take their body, his body, and put him in a tomb. As we, I just said earlier, John is the last Old Testament prophet. Jesus is the prophet of all prophets. So rejection leads to the cross. Interesting. Herod Antipas, you want to know what happens to him? His rejection of John actually becomes his own rejection. He gets so greedy with power like his daddy that he goes to Caligula. If you've heard anything about Caligula, that should tell you something there. He goes to Caligula, who's the emperor at the time. He wants to help oust one of his brothers. Caligula is actually on the side of his brothers. And they, Caligula says, you know what? I know what you and Herodias are trying to do. We're going to banish you. We're going to reject you, and you're going to go to a place that you'll never, ever have authority ever again. He goes to Gaul, which is France. He gets banished out. Herod Antipas loses all authority. So his legacy ends in shame and disgrace, but Jesus ends in praise to the glory of God and is enthroned in heaven. That's where rejection also leads to life. Because we see that in our moments of the cross, when we're living it out and trying to display the examples of sacrificial love, that we see most prominent is Jesus, who does it all for us. You see, the Lion of Judah outdid the Fox of Galilee. 
That's the conclusion of this. That while rejection looks bad, it's our actual way of living in the kingdom. So to close, what we understand is that as Christians, we will be rejected by a world that does not know and love God. In moments of rejection, we are called to come to a church of rejects. That we all get it. That we all are on the same side. We, we, we want to help each other and mutually build each other up. In our moments of weaning off the world, trying to remove the distractions of the gospel that, so we can preach the gospel, we are called to depend on the God who sovereignly provides all our needs. And in our moments of trials and tribulations, we don't really have the issues of the cross today. We really don't. Unless you're in a third world country, you're in the, 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 the basements of China, unless you're in the forests of Zimbabwe. I mean, you don't have to deal with these things. But don't belittle the reality of what the scriptures teach when we recognize that that's what they did. In fact, like I said, this will become a reality for the readers very soon after Mark was written. And so we see in this, we look to the one who provides the example of death for us. So let's pray.